Hi, for all our colleagues that are about to prepare for the board exams and are missing all the lectures, we are putting together a series of lectures for dermatopathology, which all the PATH and the derm residents can get access to free of cost so that they can prepare for the board exams. So I'm Raj Singh. I'm one of the pathologists working out of Mount Sinai in New York. And uh, these lectures have been built with help from my fellows, Ellie, L and Stephanie. So starting today with lecture one, which is spongiotic dermatitis. We will start the lectures with a series of cases. So each lecture will start off with a case and then we'll talk about the changes that are associated with that case. So the first case is a 23 year old female developed erythematous papules, vesicles and weeping patches on the trunk and the extremities. So it's very easy to see clinically that this is a spongiotic process going on. So what are the features that you would see on the biopsy? So in a biopsy, if you look at the biopsy here, the best way to approach is start from the top and then go down. So what do we see in the stratum corneum? What do we see in the epidermis? What do we see at the dermal epidermal junction? And then what do we see in the dermis? So if we start from the top in the stratum corneum, what we see is parakeratosis, some hyperkeratosis. There are usually no neutrophils here in the stratum corneum. In the epidermis shows a little bit of acanthosis that is thickening, but the more prominent feature that you see within the epidermis is the separation of the intercellular spaces by fluid. So this collection of fluid in the intercellular spaces within the epidermis is edema of the epidermis, which is called spongiosis. So eczema means edema of the epidermis. That's what it literally means down. So if you talk about spongiosis, we're talking about edema of the epidermis, that is collection of fluid between the intercellular spaces of the keratinocytes within the epidermis. Sometimes these spaces become much bigger and then they're called vesicles. We'll, uh, we'll have a look at the next slide. And in the dermis, what we see is a superficial perivascular inflammatory infiltrate that is composed predominantly of, in this case, lymphocytes. You might sometimes see admixed eosinophils that sometimes help in making a much more specific diagnosis, but you don't need them to make the diagnosis of a spongiotic process. So if I see all these findings, then I usually sign the case out as spongiotic dermatitis, see comment. And within the comment, we tell them that <coughs> The changes are suggestive of an eczematous process and your differential diagnosis includes allergic contact dermatitis, numular eczema or an id reaction. And you clinically correlate with the clinical findings. But we have to remember that spongiosis is more of a reaction pattern. We are not giving a specific diagnosis. We are not saying this is numular eczema or this is seborrheic dermatitis. All we are telling them is this is a spongiotic reaction pattern that we see on the histology, which could be caused by a lot of different things and also varies with the stage. So if the biopsy was done when the patient initially started developing the rash, then they are in an acute phase and we might see the vesiculation and the erythema. But as the disease progresses, the patient has a lot of pruritus and they keep scratching. The process becomes more subacute and there's variable scaling and crusting on the top. And then as it keeps going on, the epidermis becomes much more acanthotic, but more characteristically, the dermis starts becoming a little bit fibrotic, which is then called lichenification. So we want to see these changes on histology. Here is a change, here is a biopsy of the acute phase. So in the acute phase, you see a lot of spongiosis within the epidermis, which have developed into these large vesicles. So when the spongiosis becomes extensive, you start developing these large spaces within the epidermis because of the fluid collecting in them. And these are, these are known as vesicles. They might have Langeran cell microabscesses or inflammatory cells within the vesicle. 
characteristically because this is an acute process you don't see typically too much of hyperkeratosis and parakeratosis and that are more indicative that the process has been going on for some time and then if you look at the dermal epidermal junction it is pretty clean and the dermis then shows a superficial perivascular lymphocytic infiltrate with a lot of admixed eosinophils so the presence of spongiosis vesiculation and the admixed eosinophils point to a diagnosis of an allergic contact dermatitis as the disease becomes more chronic you'll see that the vesiculation becomes a little bit decreased what is still left is the spongiosis within the epidermis or the separation of the intercellular spaces with by fluid but the other features that indicate a little bit of chronicity are the presence of hyperkeratosis that you see on the top so in the stratum corneum you start seeing more thickened stratum corneum with admixed parakeratosis so you can see some parakeratosis now scattered throughout the stratum corneum the epidermis now starts becoming a little bit thicker which is known as acanthosis of the epidermis uh, the vesiculation is gone and you also see a superficial perivascular lymphocytic infiltrate with some fibrosis of the dermis characteristically spongiosis is always associated with some lymphocytic exocytosis within the epidermis so what is exocytosis is when lymphocytes start entering the epidermis in association with an inflammatory process then it is called lymphocytic exocytosis so the presence of hyperkeratosis some parakeratosis acanthotic epidermis and a mildly fibrotic uh, dermis are suggestive of a subacute eczematous process as the disease progresses further now you can see that the skin almost starts looking like an acral skin so the epidermis the stratum corneum becomes quite thickened or hyperkeratotic there is focal parakeratosis and characteristically some spongiosis is still seen here that tells us that this is a spongiotic process going on the epidermis is quite acanthotic mild spongiosis some lymphocytic exocytosis still going on and then the dermis characteristically <coughs> shows a little bit more fibrotic dermis actually and that is what we call as lichenification and these are all reactions to repeated trauma that the patient is doing to the skin that is they are keep scratching so this becomes thick the epidermis becomes acanthotic and then the dermis becomes fibrotic and this is what is known as a chronic eczematous process histologically so when you look talk about spongiosis it can be caused by 800 different things but the common features common things that we see in routine practice are spongiosis caused by an allergic process which is known as allergic contact dermatitis spongiosis caused by something irritating the skin from the outside so that is irritant contact dermatitis namular eczema are pres they present as those coin shaped plaque like lesions throughout the skin dyshydrotic eczema is a spongiotic process that is typically limited to the palms and the soles that is the acral site atopic dermatitis is an eczematous process is in kids and the id reaction is another eczematous process that occurs as a reaction to a rash rash somewhere else so the rash occurs on some other part of the body and the body then reacts with, in a histologically with a spongiotic reaction pattern that is known as an id reaction so here is an example of an irritant contact dermatitis so this is more like an outside job so like by an outside job what we mean is that something is irritating the skin from the outside so the patient might be having a belt that contains nickel or is wearing some ornaments that have nickel in them or there might be something that they are not so something that is irritating the skin from the outside so that causes an eczematous reaction process that can show sometimes a little bit of epidermal necrosis but this is not always present Uh, more characteristically the spongiosis is more more in the superficial part of the epidermis you might see some dyskeratosis or necrotic keratinocytes in the superficial part and then you see an admixed infiltrate that has a lot of neutrophils associated with it so in irritant contact dermatitis you see some necrotic keratinocytes and then admixed neutrophils 
when you look at a dyshydrotic eczema, it is the location of the biopsy that tells you what the diagnosis is because here you can see the thick, very thick stratum corneum. So the very thick stratum corneum tells you that you are dealing with an acral site biopsy. And within the epidermis, you see this quite a bit of vesiculation, spongiotic changes, lymphocytic exocytosis, and then a superficial perivascular lymphocytic infiltrate, which are all hallmarks of an eczematous process. So an eczematous process that is occurring in the acral site is <coughs> quite characteristic of dyshydrotic eczema. Now here is another slide that shows another, another this very similar features of an eczematous process. So you see the separation of the keratinocytes with the fluid in between in the intercellular spaces. You see the lymphocytic exocytosis. This biopsy, the one characteristic feature that we see is this parakeratosis that is in association with a hair follicle. This is known as parafollicular lipping. And the parafollicular lipping with the spongiosis is quite characteristic of seborrheic dermatitis. So if you see that feature, then you can put in the comment that this could be associated with seborrheic dermatitis, especially if the patient, if the clinician has said rule out seborrheic dermatitis. So then this feature helps quite a bit where you see the parafollicular lipping or the parafollicular parakeratosis. Sorry. Yes. And so when you consider an eczematous process, what are the other diagnoses to consider basically? You have to think of stasis dermatitis in that chapter. <coughs> other diagnoses that would come up are PR, uh, pruritic and articular papules and plaques of pregnancy and mycosis fungoides. So stasis dermatitis typically occurs on the lower leg because of vascular insufficiency. The patient has been standing for quite some time like for and this patient is in the usually in the middle 50s 60s in the middle mid middle age to lower to old age people and characteristically you what you see is the mild spongiosis in the epidermis <clears throat> and the dermis will show you these dilated vessels that have thickened walls around them and a lot of fibrosis in the dermis with red cell extravasation and hemosiderin deposition. So you can see there's a lot of hemosiderin deposition within the, the within the dermis. So hemosiderin is usually composed of this golden brown large chunky deposition basically. If and melanin is usually more black then the, if you if you look at this very carefully this is more golden brown and melanin will be more blackish and the granules are much smaller than what you see in Hemosiderin actually. So hemosiderin has larger granules, melanin has finer granules, melanin is more black and this is more golden brown. And you can always do an iron stain to stain the hemosiderin. So the pearls iron will actually stain this in a blue color. And the, for the melanin, you the stain that you use is the Fontana Masan. So mild spongiosis, thickened vessels with fibrotic walls mild fibrosis of the dermis with red cell extravasation and a lot of hemosiderin deposition are hallmark features for stasis dermatitis. Uh, for a diagnosis of PR, you need a clinical pathological correlation. So if the, di if the clinician has said rule out PR, then you are looking for features that are very specific for PR. So what are some specific features that could help you make the diagnosis? When you look at the stratum corneum, you're going to see these mounds of parakeratosis. So these mounds of parakeratosis that you see in the stratum corneum are very helpful. Let's go on the other biopsy here. Again, you'll see the mounds of parakeratosis. So a big mound and then it is hyperkeratosis. The epidermis shows a lot of spongiotic changes. And within the dermis, you see this superficial perivascular lymphocytic infiltrate and very characteristically in PR, we always see this red cell extravasation within the dermis. So the mounds of parakeratosis, spongiotic changes of the epidermis, the red cell extravasation in the dermis and the perivascular, superficial perivascular lymphocytic infiltrate. You might see some eosinophils, but they are not necessary to make the diagnosis. If they are present, it is okay. If they are not present, it is still okay basically. But what you see is a superficial perivascular lymphocytic infiltrate. 
PR can clinically look very much like syphilis. So if the clinician has not given you a very specific diagnosis, then many times it is better to do a spirochete uh, when you, you see some features like this. And especially if you see any plasma cells within the dermal infiltrate. For the, for the pruritic articular papules in plaques of pregnancy, the, this again needs a clinical input to make the diagnosis. Otherwise, it looks like a drug eruption or it could even look like an arthropod bite. So what you see are the mild spongiotic changes in the epidermis and the dermis shows a superficial and mid-dermal or even deep dermis, perivascular lymphocytic infiltrate. And there's a lot of admixed eosinophils. You can see a lot of admixed eosinophils. So if you see these features and the clinical is rule out pruritic, rule out pup, then you can make the diagnosis that this is compatible with pup. Otherwise, when you see the superficial and deep perivascular lymphocytic infiltrate with eosinophils, the common things to think of would be a drug reaction or an arthropod bite. But histologically, if it comes in, a, if clinically, if it comes in as rule out pup and you see these features, then you can say, Spongiosis with superficial and deep perivascular lymphocytic infiltrate with eosinophils, comma, compatible with the clinical impression of pup. But you still put in the differential diagnosis because it is very important to do a clinical pathological correlation to make the diagnosis. And mycosis fungoides, when we look at mycosis fungoides, we see a lot of many times we do not associate spongiosis with mycosis fungoides, but <clears throat> We have seen many cases of mycosis fungoides that will show some mild spongiosis. And then you always see the large number of lymphocytes in the epidermis. So in mycosis fungoides, when you see a large number of lymphocytes in the epidermis, the term to use is epidermotropism. So like we were using the lymphocytic exocytosis for these other spongiotic processes and for Mycosis fungoides, the same thing that is lymphocytes within the epidermis, but the term to use is lymphocytic epidermotropism. So you see a lot of atypical looking hyperchromatic lymphocytes within the epidermis with mild spongiosis and then a superficial perivascular lymphocytic infiltrate. You have to think of mycosis fungoides. <clears throat> and then the immunohistochemical stains and the gene GIMN study could help you along with the clinical input to make a much more definitive diagnosis. So to summarize, for allergy contact dermatitis, you see the eosinophils, you see the spongiosis, and then some langer and cell microabscesses. For the irritant contact dermatitis, we normally see necrotic keratinocytes with neutrophils. For septum, we talked about the parafollicular parakeratosis with spongiosis. And for stasis dermatitis, we talked about the thickened vessels in the dermis, which are surrounded by fibrosis, the inflammation, and hemosiderin. So for any of these cases that if you need more additional input, you should always, always, the one thing that you should never forget is to think of a fungal reaction, fungal infection. So for any spongiotic process or for, in, for, for any inflammatory reaction pattern, a fungal infection should always be in your differential. So you should always go and look at the stratum corneum very carefully. And when you look at it more carefully, you will always see the uh, fungus if it is present. In the tinea versicolor, it, you can see it on the HNE. So you see the, spag you see the spaghetti and the meatballs, which is very characteristic of tinea versicolor. And that is usually seen on the HNE. You do, do not need a PA stain to diagnose tinea versicolor. And when it is a dermatophytosis, you need the PA stain, which makes it very easy to see the fungus, basically. So never forget to do a PA stain whenever you're thinking of a spongiotic reaction pattern. And uh, if you want additional in-depth information about this topic or any of these diagnoses, you want to see a lot of clinical images, additional digital slides, you can use this free resource that we have put out, Dermatopathology for Residents. So this is an online book that is available on this, on this website called publications.pathpresenter.net. You just log in, uh, you register, you log in, then it's a free login. There is no money involved and you'll, you'll see this 
book which is called Dermatopathology for Residents that has a much more in-depth information about each diagnosis. Thank you. And uh, if you have any questions, please send an email to skinpathology at gmail.com. Have a nice day.